Thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Oro Cobre Limited 2020 Half-Year Results Market Update Conference Call. All participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a presentation, followed by a question and answer session. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Martin Perez de Soleil. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jesse. I would like to welcome you all to Oro Cobre's 2020 Half-Year Financial Results Presentation. Let me begin with a brief summary of the results before Mr. Neri Kaplan takes us through the half-year financials in greater detail. By now, I am sure that we are all aware that over the past 12 months, the leasing market has been challenging for all producers. Despite the soft market conditions persisting, Orocover has again delivered positive operational results, although the Orocover Group posted a consolidated net loss after tax of $18.9 million. Despite this, the cash position of the company continues to be strong with $212.2 million of cash on our balance sheets, which yields a $115.5 million net cash position. Safety, along with productivity and quality, remains our key focus. We believe safety is the foundation to improve performance. Throughout the half year, CLTIs were recorded at all arrows, with all staff returning to work on full duties. Recognizing the ongoing soft market conditions, our operational focus has been on process stability and product quality. This has enabled further development of the bond system and brand inventory, improving our operational resilience through seasonal weather variations. The combined results of this effort culminated in a new record of 6,679 tons of lithium carbonate being produced during the half, which was up 10% from previous corresponding period. We are seeing higher processing capability and improved quality and consistency of both our industrial and battery-grade products, and we are steadily working towards increasing the production of purified products being produced. Sales revenue for the half was $39.4 million from sales of 6,395 tons, which was achieved with an average price received of $6,157 per ton. This resulted in gross cash margin of $1,514 per ton for the half. Importantly, operating margins have been maintained at 25%, resulting in a positive operating profit of $6.1 million. We remain confident that our full-year operation will be at least 5% higher than financial year 19, and the expected product prices of the March quarter to be approximately $5,000 per ton. Following the end of the December quarter, Orocover finalized two long-term supply contracts, which will see two top-tier Chinese custard manufacturers supply the combined total of 10,080 tons of battery-grade lithium carbonate over the next three years. And finally, sales at Borax for the half year were $9.6 million we generated an operation of EBITDA loss of 0.2 million after conditions in the Brazilian market softened. I will now pass to Orocover's chief financial officer, Mr. Neil Kaplan, to run through the financial results in more detail. Thanks, Martin, and a good morning to all. First up is the consolidated P&L. While stun sold increased by approximately 24%, Pricing has been the main contributor to lower revenues with an average price of US $6,157 a ton being received versus $12,295 a ton for the prior corresponding period. Revenue includes an adjustment to sales price due to a customer reallocation of product. Olaroz cash cost of sales of US $4,643 a ton is higher than the same period in FY19 of $4,251 a ton, excluding royalties, export duties, and head office costs, mainly due to the reduction in the export incentive due to lower sales, and a warranty provision related to packaging costs. A bridge of Oleros's EBITDAX from first half FY19 to first half FY20 can be seen in an upcoming slide. In spite of the soft market conditions, gross margin remained positive at $1,514 a ton, or a 25% cash margin. EBITDAX includes approximately US $2.6 million related to export duties, 
and restructuring costs of $600,000. However, it excludes a $1 million supply cost, which is treated as a lease in terms of AASB 16. Depreciation costs of U.S. $1,215 a ton versus FY19 U.S. $974 a ton include the amortization of the uplift in value resulting from consolidating on a ROS and the adoption of AASB 16 related to leases. An appendix in this presentation details the effect of AASB 16 on the balance sheet and profit and loss. Foreign exchange losses mainly relate to VAT and other balance sheet items which are PESO denominated. The share of losses of associates relates to AAL US for 0.4 million and the Naraha lithium hydroxide plant US 0.2 million. The income tax benefit is mainly due to the loss for the period which resulted in an increase to the carry forward tax losses. This resulted in a statutory loss on a 100% basis after tax of US $18.9 million. Moving on to the next slide, this slide details the underlying profit. In moving from the statutory loss of US $18.9 million on a 100% basis to an underlying loss after tax of US $9.9 million, we have made the necessary adjustments as detailed on the slide. The underlying loss of US $9.9 million for first half FY20 is mainly due to lower average lithium prices received, slightly higher costs, higher depreciation, and higher finance costs in Olaroz, as well as reduced interest income in Orocobre. Moving to the next slide, this slide details the bridge between Olaroz's EBITDAX for first half FY19 of US $56.6 million and the first half of FY20 EBITDAX of US $6.1 million. The main components of the reduction are related to lithium pricing of US $31.7 million and costs related to increased volume sold of US $4.3 million offset by sales revenues related to volume of US $7.6 million. Whilst the effect of such items was substantial, Olaroz has reported a positive EBITDAX of US $6.1 million. Moving to the next slide, this slide details what the consolidated balance sheet looks like at 31 December 2019 versus 30 June 2019. The column on the right is what the consolidated balance sheet at 30 June 2019 looked like after the fair value uplift due to consolidation in the last financial year. The key points on the balance sheet are, cash has reduced given the funding of stage two expansion, and consequently property plant and equipment has increased mainly as a result of the stage two expansion. The investment in associates has decreased mainly to the impairment of AAL of $4.1 million. Current external borrowings reduced as a result of the repayment of a portion of the Olaroz working capital facilities due to a change in Argentine re regulation, whilst the non-current external borrowings increased due to shareholders' loans from TTC, largely offset by repayment to Mizuho for the Stage 1 project finance loan. The principal on the Stage 1 project finance loan has reduced from US $191.9 million to approximately US $99 million at 31 December 2019 and in three weeks' time will have reduced to approximately US $88 million. A reduction of the deferred tax liability is mainly due to the loss for the period, which resulted in an increase to the carried forward tax losses. The finance lease liability increase of US $25.8 million is due to the effect of AASB 16 related to leases. Moving to the next slide, Cash generated from operations resulted in a negative balance of US $2.1 million. However, from an operational perspective, this was positive taking into account corporate outflows of approximately US $4.4 million and interest charges of approximately $5.9 million. In detailing some of the main movements, 
The purchase of property, plant and equipment relates to sustaining and expansion capex. Investment in associates represents our participation in an AAL private placement. Repayment of borrowings is the reduction of the principal for the Stage 1 project finance loan and repayment of US dollar working capital facilities. And the proceeds of borrowings relate to TTC shareholders' loans to Olaroz and a drawdown of PESEL working capital facilities. So in summary, despite a soft lithium market, Olaroz continues to be operationally profitable and we continue to pay down debt with over $100 million that would have been repaid by March 2020. Thank you, and I will now pass you back to Martin. Thank you, Neil. Let's move on to the operational reviews. The management and improvement of all our stage one performance remain focused on safety, quality, and productivity. The implementation of Intellect as our central safety management database has progressed well throughout the half. Our central safety committees have continued to make good progress developing and improve operating discipline at all of us. The implementation of specialized operator training and more frequent risk assessment has already produced greater consistency in all of us product quality and production process. With all of us production process becoming more stable, our analysis has confirmed a sustained improvement of process capability, CPK, regarding the final product's analytical profile. In recognizing current market conditions, the operational focus for all our has been process and product quality rather than maximizing production tonnage. Towards the end of the half, a regimented financial plan was implemented aimed at further reducing unit cash costs. This should maintain our current competitive position as one of the world's lowest cost brine based lithium carbonate producers. The Olaroth Stage 2 expansion will increase total expected lithium carbonate production capacity by 25,000 tons to approximately 42,500 tons per annum of defined capacity, of which 10,000 tons will be used as seed stock for the Naraha lithium hydroxide plant. Commission of Stage 2 expansion remains on track to commence in mid-2021. The Stage 2 expansion achieved a number of milestones during the half including the construction, drilling, and testing of new production wells. And so far, the newly completed wells are delivering flow rates and leasing concentrations that exceed original expectations. International engineering company Worley are now on site undertaking supervisory works, and the detailed engineering of the new carbonate plant is expected to be completed in June half. Civil works for the new carbonation plant are expected to commence in June half with the structural steel currently en route to Olaroth after being shipped to Chile. Recent works on site have included brine transport systems, rain diversion channels, decommissioning of the secondary lining plant together with road, camp upgrades, and three new evaporation ponds. And as of today's date, vegetation clearing and construction of additional 16 evaporation ponds is underway. During the half, a 180 million debt facility was finalized with Mitujo Bank to be used for the stage two expansion of the Olaroz operation. Recently, conditions precedent have been finalized allowing the drawdown of the first tranche of the facility. Importantly, the debt facility has a 10 year term with a low interest rate of less than 4% per annum. Moving on to the Naraja leasing hydroxide plant, since construction commenced there, have been no LTIs recorded. The Veolia Dream Venture is undertaking weekly safety meetings and regular site safety checks. Veolia Water Technologies and TTC project staff continue to attend safety training in alignment with the project safety management plans. During the September quarter, I hosted a groundbreaking ceremony at the Naraha plant construction site together with TTC and to Yutsu Lithium Corporation representatives. Since then, construction activities have progressed very well with more than 40% of plan works now completed. Construction is expected to accelerate during the March quarter as more than 95% of purchase orders for key components and equipment have been placed. Civil and architectural construction of several key plant components commenced during the December quarter, which included lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide storage facilities, a laboratory, 
a waste, a waste water treatment plants, the Kelly Structure Plant Foundation, roads and liquid CO2 storage foundation. Fabrication of the Naraja plant process and utilities equipment will continue during the March quarter. As of December 31, approximately 39.3 million have been spent of the first phase of engineering works and procurement. At the end of the half, more than 40% of the project have been completed. Commissioning of the Naraja plant remains on track to commence during the first half of calendar year 2021. Two LTIs were recorded at the Tinkalayu mine during the half, with all employees returning to work on full duties. Operations at Borax have continued to focus on minimizing the cost of production, with unit costs continuing to be controlled. Current stock inventory levels remain well above minimum required levels. Sales were up 4.7% on the previous corresponding period for a total of 21,094 tons of combined products, despite a drop in sales to the Brazilian market. Several new long-term agreements were signed during the half with world-class players in the fertilizer and industrial sectors. There is a renewed focus in the thousand corn market of Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and Borax also developing new product distribution throughout Asia. As announced earlier this week, we have entered into a definitive agreement with Advantage Lithium to acquire 100% of the reissued and outstanding shares that the company does not already hold. If approved, our cover stands to gain the 4.8 million tons of measured and indicated resources and 1.5 million tons of inferred resources currently defined at Cauchari. The integration of the Cauchari resource with all our will enable us to deliver optimal basin management with maximizing the long-term productive capacity of the all our Cauchari basin. Under the terms of the agreement, Advantage shareholders will receive 0.142 Orocobra shares for every Advantage share they held. This equates to Orocobra issuing approximately 15.1 million shares to Advantage shareholders. This transaction will allow us to continue cost-effective development of the Olaros Cauchari basins, and it does not trigger the need for additional financing for ongoing development of the project. Once completed, the transaction will cement the company's position as one of the world's lowest cost lithium chemical producers, to the great benefit of all of our shareholders and stakeholders. Moving on, I would like to hand over to Tara Berry to discuss the lithium market. Thank you, Martin. During the half, the lithium market remained challenged by unchanged demand fundamentals, including slower Chinese EV market growth, a sluggish Chinese economy, and the U.S.-China trade war. While there was no catalyst of sufficient magnitude to lift price, there were signs of improving demand conditions outside of China, most notably within the European market. Earlier in the year, the European Commission reinstated intentions to impose a 95 euro penalty for every gram of carbon emissions that a car manufacturer's new car sales exceeded a 95 gram per kilometre limit. This is not the first time, however, a carbon emissions target and penalty regime will be used in the European market to influence car manufacturer behaviour. In 2007, the European Commission announced a plan to penalise car manufacturers that exceeded a 130 gram per kilometre limit from 2012 scaling up the penalty from 20 euros to 95 euros by 2015. Car manufacturers met the 2012 target, reducing the average industry emissions from 160 grams to 130 grams per kilometre in just four years and therefore avoiding financial penalties. In lieu of a new target, CO2 emissions remain stagnant between 2016 and 2018 as car manufacturers released models with only incremental changes. As a result, there was little incentive for traditional diesel and petrol-powered drivers to shift preference. Moving on to the next slide. With the knowledge existing EV models have largely reached saturation of the potential addressable market, car manufacturers have committed to aggressive product development. This slide outlines their plans to accelerate the release of new EV models from 2020 
in Europe and the success this strategy has already had in, Dece in the December quarter when Europe achieved record sales. Abandoning a strategy of largely targeting niches with incremental changes, car manufacturers now plan to target masses, bringing together popular traits of flagship models, improved battery performance, and most importantly, a lower price tag that brings EVs in line with internal combustion equivalents and possibly lower after subsidies. Currently, 12 of the EU countries offer incentives that reduce the purchase price, while most countries also provide tax reductions or exemptions for purchase and ownership. In 2019, the largest European car market, Germany, increased subsidies, particularly benefiting lower price EVs. In Germany, consumer subsidies for electric vehicles that cost less than 45, $45,500 US dollars increased by $2,500 to about $6,700 US dollars. The revised incentive structure has proven effective already. In December 2019, the total cumulative sales of EVs in Germany hit over 57,500, allowing Germany to surpass Norway as Europe's biggest seller of electric cars. More recently, in January 2020, Germany's sales were up 62% year on year. As the largest car market in Europe and one of the largest in the world, Germany's increased appetite for EVs provides a large potential demand catalyst for the battery chain. Moving on to the next slide. Battery manufacturers have been quick to respond to Europe's momentum with a flurry of battery plant investments announced late 2019 and continuing into 2020. Top tier battery and car manufacturers have been drawn to Europe's potential, providing greater certainty that the expansions will go ahead. With these announcements taken into consideration, Europe will become the second largest battery manufacturer in 10 years, second only to China, and with that, gain 10% share of a battery market that will grow by almost five times. Moving on to the next slide. On this slide, we look at the long-term supply and demand situation. With Europe gaining momentum in the near term and China inevitably recovering, it's likely that marginal production currently under pressure will be required, particularly given the impact that project delays will have on the future. Moving on to the next slide. During 2019, a number of large-scale supply curtailments were made, having an ongoing impact. Looking at the anticipated 2020 supply, as per announcements made in 2017 and 2018, almost half the expected supply volume has been removed. Less than 10% of the curtailment is due to moderated production from existing operations, meaning over 90% of the supply eliminated in 2020 is accounted for by expansions or new projects that cannot be restarted or ramped up as required by demand. Of the approximate 330,000 tonnes taken out of the market, almost 80% is accounted for by hard rock sources, illustrating the challenges of bringing on independent hard rock into an inefficient, higher cost conversion market. Moving on to the next slide. Previous research performed by the company into the conversion plant market revealed a significant difference between the capabilities of converters and therefore their operating utilisation rates. While almost three years have passed since this initial research and the total lithium market has grown by approximately 50%, little improvement has been made in the performance of marginal converters. And as a result, Lithium chemical supply growth from hard rock sources has largely come from Tier 1 converters. Capabilities remain concentrated and an inefficient conversion market poses a potential bottleneck as demand accelerates. So in conclusion, on the basis of recent supply reductions, potential conversion plant bottlenecks and growing momentum in Europe, Oracobre believes there is potential for improved market conditions mid to late 2020. 
While the coronavirus may delay an improvement to market balance due to logistical challenges and operational closures throughout the battery supply chain, this is not expected to impact the size of Europe's growth potential, instead creating potential for pent-up demand. And now I will pass it on to Martin to conclude the presentation. Thank you, Tara. In summary, market conditions remain difficult, but our operations are making significant progress in terms of safety, quality, and productivity. We see the current quarter pricing to remain soft, but subject to external influences, such as the coronavirus, we see that demand fundamentals will have a positive impact on market conditions later in the year. Thank you, Jesse, and we will now take questions. Thank you. If you wish to ask a question via the phones, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone keypad. The first question comes from Raul Anand with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I've got uh, a couple. I might start with the uh, transaction, please. Um, in terms of basin management that you were talking about, uh, Martine, if you could help us understand a bit. I mean, is there any um, current issues with uh, brine quality being uh, uh, that's been coming out of the bores, or, or is this purely just future future management uh, that we're looking at here? Thank you, Raul, for joining and for your question. Um, basically, there are no issues with the current brine quality. Indeed, the results of the wells that we're drilling for expansion are coming better than expected in terms of flow rates and and brine and leaking concentration in the brine. Uh, this is more a long-term basin management uh, strategy that um, we, we clearly think that uh, this is not a basin for three projects in the long run, and um, we are, we, this will position us to better control future events that, that may pop up. Okay, understood. Um, second question for you, Martin, is around um, uh, the use of lime. I mean, sh is there any possibility that the, the flow sheet can change at this point whereby you start applying lime in the process perhaps after evaporation, like um, one of your peers has, has designed a flow sheet? For the time being, we are keeping uh, the same flow sheet on stage one and making certain improvements on stage two to improve the product quality as to what our customers require, uh, but uh, we're not thinking of any major change. Nonetheless, uh, we we are very active in terms of research and development, continuing to look into new technologies that may help us drive the costs further down and, and continue to improve the product quality. Product quality has, has moved upwards significantly during the last year in terms of leasing concentration in primary products. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, overall quality parameters for, for our products. Yeah, so I was sort of more focused on the cost side, I guess, there. Um, okay, uh, one sort of financial question then, uh, the withholding tax increase for uh, the overseas dividends. How should we think about those, Neil? No, there's no withholding tax uh, increase. It's deferred. You're talking about the 7% to the 13%. I'm talking about the last few slides in the presentation where uh, there's, um, you know, the talk of the withholding tax changes. Yeah, the rate will go down and the withholding tax will go up. Right, okay. So from our per, for our purposes, basically no change? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay, that's all from me. I'll pass it on. Thank you. The next question comes from Nick Herbert with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, all. Just a uh, few from me, please. Um, just starting on Advantage Lithium. I uh, understand it's still a fair way off, but could you just talk to what you think about conceptual timing of that project development and then also how you're thinking about uh, infrastructure and whether that'll be utilizing uh, all arise infrastructure and, and then just some initial thoughts around uh, what saving that could achieve in terms of capex relative to what the uh, Advantage Lithium Feasibility Study put out? Well, uh, number one, thank you, Nick, for your question. Number one is that uh, we're not planning to do um, a development of a project in terms of building a plant in Advantage. 
uh, but rather thinking of using that brine in future expansions at Olaros, where we should take advantage of the synergies and having all the services already built and constructed. That will enable us to reach the development of that brine in the future at a, at a much lower cost. At the same time, it also gives us the option to monetize the brine within existing facilities at a faster rate. So that's the overall take out from the deal. Well, that makes sense. Are you able to sort of get some idea of what your initially um, or your initial work has shown on potential capex savings versus that um, feasibility study of Advantage, or it's just too early? Well, I think it's too early, and we are not planning to. As I told you, to build a new plan to develop those resources, it should be further expansions on existing oil and facilities that will enable us to develop uh, and use that brine. Got it. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Uh, second one, just the, the new alarming plan that's due to come online. Um, you talked of cost savings there. Can you just outline the magnitude of those cost savings, please? Neil, would you have some detail on, on, on lining issues? Uh, most of the cost, of, uh, as an introduction, I can tell you that most of the savings have been around the, the soda ash and, 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 and other reagents. Uh, the secondary lining plant is just starting operations as we speak, has already been completed and its main objective is to line the brine that we are starting to cook for the expansion project. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then just finally, uh, coronavirus impact. Um, with your discussions with customers, what are you hearing uh, around volumes and, and disruptions there? Uh, and at this point, do you have any expectation uh, around your March sales volumes and whether they'll be impacted? Uh, I, I will divert that one to David, that, that, that is good asking the call. Hi Nick, uh, look just to summarise I suppose what uh, what we're seeing and it's, it's in line I think with you know, a lot of the the research that uh, the, the banks have documented. There, there's certainly an impact in, in China which everybody um, acknowledges with you know some businesses being closed or curtailed in terms of um, production. Uh, there's also an effect on raw material costs and and logistics. So in in short, what we're seeing is customers where we already have uh, commercial agreements in place. Uh, they are uh, erring to the cautious side. I think you'd, you'd describe it. They're they're obviously still buying, but they're watching the environment quite closely. Uh, those that don't uh, yet have uh, commercial agreements in, in place, uh, uh, also being very cautious um, you know, to the point of they're largely sitting on their hands uh, at this point in time just to see how the situation plays out over the next couple of weeks. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, that's it for me, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from Levi Spry with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, a few questions from me. Uh, got off pretty lightly so far. Um, so Barney's Lithium, um, just remind me like um, the strategy behind that other than just buying something at the bottom of the cycle. So you spun that out originally, right? So why buy it back now? How did you value it? Um, can you take me through the, the process there? Well, the, pro the project was initially spun out to to get the focus it required in, in exploration while the stage one was being developed at all of us, which required two different focuses. Um, the, the the work performed by the Advantage team has been very good in terms of developing the resources and, and being able to, to measure them. Uh, and um, at the current situation and understand the current market situation, we think it's a good moment to increase our resources in the basin and increase our control over the basin as well. Uh, we, as, as I said before, we don't think that uh, three projects in the basin would be an efficient management of, of resources there, and this project not only enables us to manage resources efficiently, it gives us a lot of optionality in the future to further increase production and also to be able to monetize the brine that has already been drilled in a, in a faster way. Yep. Okay, so how did you go about valuing it? And with regards to pricing, I think it's, it is impacted by the current market situation, and we think it's a very good price 
for them such shareholders at, uh, at this point in time uh, because they will benefit from the current production from Morocco as they will benefit from increased lithium prices in the future holding the stock of Morocco. Okay, thank you. Um, so on to, on to the price then. So uh, $5,000 tonnes for this quarter, your expectations. Um, and you've talked about improvement later in the year. Um, have you given us cost guidance? Is there, is there potential that you would rationalise your own volumes if prices went below 5000 bucks? So far, our strategy has been to further reduce our costs and maintain our sales level. To the largest extent possible, we will continue to do that. We are enjoying um, a good cash margin. Neil can talk on this in more detail, but that enables us to, to cover all, all our costs, including financing. And, uh, and you know, that the name of the game for us is to be the lowest cost produced in the market rather than reducing production. Uh, obviously, from an inventory management perspective, as we did at, towards the end of the, of the last year, we may slightly reduce production not to have a, a large amount of inventory. But our objective is more to reduce the costs than to cut production. Yeah, okay, thank you. And just on stage two, so I think from your presentation you said you've spent about a third of the capital. Can you just give us an update on on uh, on how that's tracking versus your budget um, and, and when you plan to draw the debt? Well, basically, the debt, the debt is already being drawn down. We've started uh, uh, two weeks ago. Oh, really, is that right? Uh, we That's started uh, yeah, just yeah, about 10 days ago we started. And uh, with regards to the progress on the project, uh, we are very well advanced with the construction of the ponds. Uh, we, we are uh, slightly below time budget in the lining of those pumps. We're drilling the wells, we're getting good flow rates from the wells, we're getting good brine concentrations in the wells that we're drilling. The carbonation plant is the largest uh, piece of uh, engineering that is being completed, will be completed during the June quarter, and um, and that will enable us to you know finalize uh, construction biddings and, and, and final costs, uh, because all the other things are already in progress. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Warren Edney with Bailu. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I'm going to ask about advantage of the as well, because I'm just like a, to get some understanding of the time, why why now, the timing of it, given that the, the VWAP for the last, uh, I guess, October, November, December was a very low 20 cents a share, um, Canadian, and even over the last month, it was about 35, and you're effectively offering something like 40, 44, 45, 46 cents a share um, in Oracobra shares. And the market still looks like it's still going to be very weak. So I just wondered why doing it now and, and why paying what appears to be quite a significant premium. Well, the, your question raises a couple of, uh, of uh, points. Uh, number one is whether premium is significant. Uh, yes, indeed it is, but it is the average premium that is paid for this type of transactions in the Canadian market. Uh, it's, it's not uh, above nor below the standard transaction for uh, standard premium for this type of transactions that involve control premiums. In terms of uh, the timing, um, it, it's quite difficult to you know get the bottom, the exact bottom of the cycle, or get the exact uh, up point of the, cycle, of the cycle when you're either selling or buying, uh, we think it's the right timing to do it. Uh, because if you think at the amount uh, that we are paying per ton of measured indicated resource, uh, it, it is quite a convenient price for us to do it as, as, as you look at it compared to other transactions or, or other companies that are trading with true measured indicated resources. Okay, thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from Reg Spencer with Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, just read some uh, market commentary recently that, that Gan Feng had uh, lifted prices ever so slightly, uh, not 
so much driven by demand, but more around the pass-through of, of increased logistics costs in China, given the recent impact of the coronavirus. Um, do, do you see the possibility of, of that happening uh, amongst other producers and potentially giving you a little bit of an uplift uh, on, on pricing? Uh, and, and is that a, a realistic scenario whereby producers are passing through higher costs uh, to their customers, the cathode manufacturers? If I can ask Tara to, to answer you, she's the expert in, in that area. Sure, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thanks for the question, Reg. Um, I think I think it's, it's difficult to, as David said um, previously, it's difficult to get a read on the impact of the coronavirus right now, and the impact is is quite mixed um, between um, between all the producers. So, you know, the Chinese producers are saying that they're experiencing higher raw materials. Um, I think, you know, the obvious one is sulfuric, sulfuric acid and um, and lime. So uh, I think they're experiencing higher raw materials prices, which, you know, we're kind of immune to. So in terms of passing that on with price, uh, that's, a, that's a wait and see to see whether that impacts us. Um, overnight, Albemarle and, and, and Liven have come out with their results and, and they're seeing a softer condition. So, you know, as, as Dave said, it's a little bit of a wait and see for now. And um, in terms of the overall market balance, I think it, it hit the whole supply chain, right, from raw materials right down to EV manufacturers. So it's a matter of getting a gauge on what part of the battery chain is starting up um, first um, and, and then that will sort of determine inventory levels and, and price outcomes. Um, ultimately, I think it's just deferring demand until the second half, and we might see a really strong second half. And as, as I mentioned in the presentation, there's early signs of, of some, some very meaningful momentum in, in Europe. Okay, that's good. And just on, on that inventory... Right. Just, we... in, general, in general terms... To complete uh, Tara's question, I think that you may see some short-term adjustment due to cost uh, increases, but this is a market where the price drives it and the price drives the demand and supply has to adjust to prices, and that's the way we see it. Okay, understood. Just on, on the impact of the coronavirus then, you, you talk about uh, improving demand uh, conditions in the second half. Uh, we all know that there are still some significant inventories uh, throughout various parts of the supply chain. And obviously, uh, a deferral of any increase in demand uh, means a deferral of any working down of those inventories. Um, so, uh, but do you think that any delay in, in the inventory unwind uh, could be offset by significant increases in demand out of Europe? Is, is that a fair comment? Yeah, Reg, I think that's a fair summary of, of what I was of what I was saying. Um okay. I mean outside of Europe the uh, sorry, outside of China the demand is strong and um any supply chain that can um that is excludes China, um can can sort of they can their inventory can be worn down, I suppose. So on that basis then guys, is, is any change to your geographic mix of your customer base and your contracting over the next little while, has that forced a bit of a rethink uh, into the discussions you've been having over the last few months? Rich, I think what we've indicated in the past is that um, traditionally we've had a, a fairly even spread in terms of geography uh, within the business. That changed to a greater exposure to China. Uh, in recent times as the, as the market tightened up. Um, so we're in the, the process now of, of working that back, if you like, back into a more balanced picture. Um, so, you know, longer term, we, we still see ourselves having a, a position in, in China, but it'll be sort of back around the 20 to 25% um, level. 
Okay, that's great. And just lastly, uh, another question on Advantage Lithium. I'll take a bit of a different angle this time. Um, are you guys able to provide to the market some kind of information on the well locations for the Ganfeng operations and, and where they're situated relative to the uh, Advantage uh, resource? Um, and if those wells are in a location which, which could potentially lead to some level of resource depletion on the, on the Advantage properties, does that change how you might think about the development of those resources and, and bring them into a, a potential expansion at all arise uh, sooner than, than you might otherwise have? A lot of that rest depends on... The, we, we are looking into the positions of the wells. Uh, we are looking into uh, the distance between wells. We are looking into the, the speed of the pressure wave within the salar. We're building our hydrogeological models. We're trying, you know, this is still something that we're trying to, to understand and progress. And that's uh, why we think that uh, two operations in the same salar are much better than three operations. It's better to get into agreement and, and produce uh, an efficient uh, uh, drawdown of the, of the resource, which, which is the final objective. Um, we now sitting on top of our properties and should the deal be approved by advantage shareholders, uh, we will have to sit down and, and understand how the whole basin operates in terms of hydrogeology, how the fluids move and, um, and how the pressure waves uh, work underneath the first place. And understanding all that, uh, we, we can, you know, put forward a, um, a long-term sustainable efficient way to draw down the, the resources, which, which is the, the, the most strategic objective of, of this transaction. Okay. And just one final question on this before I pass it on. Uh, are there any other hurdles uh, which might prevent or, or, or present as a challenge in, in terms of developing that, that Kachari resource, noting that the, the Ganfeng properties pretty much sit between uh, Olaroz and, and those of advantage, uh, w would you require some kind of agreement or easement from Ganfeng in order to pump uh, brine across their, their tenement holdings or how might conceptually that work or is it just too, too early to, to, to make a call? Well, I think it is too early but if you look at the way the properties are, these properties are surrounding Ganfeng's operations in, in Kauchari and further to the south uh, between Ganfeng and, and Rokobre on the Olaro uh, flat salt. Both alas are communicated uh, and, um, and and with regards to future easement rights, I don't see any problem in Argentina. Um, no, the, the law provides for easy arrangement of, of easement rights. Okay. So I, I, I don't foresee that as a problem. Should that be required? But I think it is too early. The first stage is to understand the hydrogeological model, how it works, how it operates, and uh, what's the best possible way or the, the most efficient way of drawing down resources in the long term. Okay, understood. Thanks very much, guys. I'll, I'll pass it on. And, and it's always easier to get into agreement between two parties and three parties. <laughs> yeah, understood, understood. Thanks very much, Martin. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> the next question comes from Harsh Vardia with City. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, one one more question on the lithium market, uh, maybe for Tara. Uh, recently, there have been some comeback of LFP batteries. Um, how do you think about mix evolving over medium term? Basically, what I'm trying to understand is with this Nahara plant commissioning next year, is the market still transitioning into hydroxide directionally, and therefore the price premium expectation over carbonate? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Harsh. Um, so. <laughs> LSP batteries, there's always going to be a place for, for those. Um, they're used in power tools and in a lot of consumer electronics, so there'll always be demand for that. Um, what we're seeing is, I suppose, to put it simplistically, a divide between China and Europe at the moment, presently, um, where China is, is favouring LSP because they're getting good energy density from um, some improvements in those, which is equivalent to the nickel-based sort of like mid-generation 523s or 523s and 622s. So um, 
as a result of those improvements in the LFP technology, there's less incentive for them to, to move across until they can prove, until they can um, produce the, those nickel-based cathodes that require hydroxide um, at a lower cost um, and also safely. So outside of that, though, we're seeing that um, EVs that are being being manufactured in Europe are favouring the nickel-based cathodes and um, that's being reflected by um, hydroxide, uh, hydroxide prices and hydroxide demand. So to answer your question, I think that there'll always be a place for lithium carbonate. Um, it will be largely in China um, because of LFP. Uh, the transition to nickel-based cathodes will likely still occur in China but just at a with a with a lag to the rest of the world, I think. Thanks, Sarah. So, just a related question: the Tesla's recent move, um, uh, which is again China-centric, to um, get exposure to LFP batteries, uh, do you think it's limited to the to the regional uh, dynamics, and it's uh, not going to you know, spread in European and, and the US market, or, or is it like you know more of a price-conscious decision? Um, I, I don't think that at all that it's, it's going to spread. Um, you, we're seeing that um, Chinese manufacturers or Chinese battery manufacturers are actually going and in investing capacity in Europe um, alongside the European, um, alongside European and, and South Korean and, and Japanese battery manufacturers, um, and they have an aim of actually producing um, of producing nickel-based cathodes. So it's it's more about what the what the EV um, consumers want out of their cars. Um, so in, in Europe, for example, they they favour longer range um, EVs and they require that for um, for their transport behaviour, I guess, for their driving behaviour. Whereas in China, they don't require the energy density and range requirements that a European or the rest of the world consumer is wanting. So that's a, it's kind of a, a consumer preferences um, driven um, decision from battery manufacturers and, and the whole battery chain as a result. Thank you. The next question comes from Adam Baker with Global Mining Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, morning, guys. Uh, just wondering, you know, given that you still got about 100 US 190 million of capex to spend on stage two Olorals expansion, just wondering if you've considered pushing back or delaying it, uh, given you know the current lithium price environment and the squeeze on margins. The the answer is that we continue with the the program on expansion as as, as we outlined. Um, it is already a bit delayed. We are now targeting to complete it in the reaching mechanical completion in the first half of 2021 calendar year and uh, initiating commission in the second and ramping up, uh, initiating the, the ramp up and production, having production in the second half of 2021, but not for, for market reasons. You know, we more or less took a more cautious view during last year. Uh, the key and important part of, of the expansion is that it will, will enable us to further reduce the, the costs of the operations as, as we will be able to dilute fixed costs among a larger base of production and sales, and, uh, and that will significantly benefit our operations from a cost perspective. And as I said before, the way we see this market is, is you know, being the low-cost producer is the, is the final objective that, that we have here. We have to be able to have a cost and a quality that enable us to sell our product at any market price and, and make a profit, which is what has been the strategy. So based on that, we're continuing to go ahead with expansion. Thank you. The next question comes from Bria Murphy with BMO, BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi. Good evening. It's actually Joel Jackson at BMO. Um, how are you? Um, I, I had a couple questions. Um, just back a bit on some of the LFP discussion. So we're seeing a shift back a bit to LFP or gradual rollout of some of the more nickel-rich NMC cathodes. So that, that's not good for hydroxide in China, but we're seeing good probably hydroxide demand in Europe. So have, do you have any change views on hydroxide versus carbonate growth trajectory over the midterm? Thanks. Um, 
In terms of the in terms of the growth trajectory, no, I think um, I think it hasn't changed our um, our views in terms of the split of hydroxide to carbonate. Um, it's we model our, our demand from the bottom up. So, um, oh, sorry, I guess maybe more so from EV model backwards. So looking at what EV model um, what the EV models um, battery is that they use, and then model it back through to hydroxide and carbonate. Um, so, um, with the knowledge, I suppose we, we saw late last year, yeah, late last year, um, and, and I guess early throughout the whole year, we were aware of the fact that um, there was difficulty in switching to the nickel-based um, nickel based cathode in China. So, it hasn't really changed our opinions um, and the assumptions that we've, we've made on, on that split. Um, and as I mentioned, I, you know, Hydroxide demand, or, or hydroxide demand in China will increase over time, and, and will probably incrementally take um, take share away, I suppose, from from carbonate demand. But as I said, there'll always be a place for carbonate, and that will be largely concentrated in in China as a result of their um, of their consumer consumer needs for EVs. Thank you for that. Um, and then my second question would be, what can you do on cost in the next few quarters? Are there um, some laying fruit left, any improvements? Um, um, what do you think are the uh, opportunities there? Martin, I'll, I'll pick this one up. Yes, please. Hi, Jordan. Please. It, uh, it's Neil. Um, well, we've got a bunch of different things going on, uh, which uh, – Towards the end of last year, we, we started um, a plan to reduce costs. Uh, obviously, firstly, is reagents. So there's a, a focus by the operational team uh, on the consumption ratios to reduce those, and, and those consumption ratios are being worked on as we speak. It, it started uh, at the back end of last year and continues and will continue into the future given reagents is a substantial portion of our cost base, as well as renegotiation of key reagent uh, contracts. Flowing on from that, we'd have logistics, where, again, we're renegotiating uh, the contracts with suppliers and also trying to be more efficient with uh, the, lo the logistics. So, in other words, if we're bringing soda ash into the country, we would... Uh, come in with soda ash, and then the truck would go back with lithium carbonate back to the port. So looking at efficiencies like that, uh, as well as um, – we're looking at every area. We're looking at maintenance, uh, tenders. We, we're reviewing man hours. Uh, we're looking at the camp, accommodation, food, cleaning, uh, etc. So in every facet of the business, uh, we continue – to see where we can uh, shave cost um, and, and keep it at the lowest cost possible. So, to, sorry, and uh, to, to answer your question, uh, yeah, we're going to focus on trying to get, if we can, below $4,000 a ton. Uh, that will obviously be based on volume. You know, if you, you get all your costs down but you, you, you don't get the right volume being sold, then your, your cost goes up given, uh, you, you know, you're spreading fixed costs over lower tons. So uh, that, that's a goal that, that the whole team is focused on throughout the company. That does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.